they're requesting their membership transfer over there. On the, on the nice side of things, we have some people that are transferring in. So I would like to uh, read the names, and we're going to vote for those names today. Um, we have uh, Bhakti Hutahayan, um, and uh, Lubis Herlina. They're moving to our church from the Astoria SDA Church in uh, New York, Astoria, New York. So we're we gonna have a chance to welcome them into our fellowship today. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I murdered the the the, 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 the I butchered the names. Did I? Was it was it decent? Wasn't that too bad? Okay, I'm glad to hear at least. Um, and um, and. Um, uh, we also uh, welcome Carlos Griffith, Carlos Griffith from the Forest Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, we welcome into our fellowship also Greg Santos, Greg Santos uh, from the Mission Hope uh, SDA Church in Mission, Texas. And we welcome back into our fellowship a wonderful, beautiful lady that we have missed a lot, because she moved for some time to the south side of Austin, Nell Marie Anderson. So we have a chance to get Nell's membership again into our church. Uh, to my understanding, Nell is now the oldest member of our congregation, right? And she is back, back with us. So does anyone move that we accept uh, these names? Uh, back to Ronald, Herlina, Carlos, Nell, and Greg into our fellowship. There's a motion. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Great. It's uh, a, a pleasure for us to welcome uh, new members into our, our fellowship. Um, as you know, uh, this past week was a, a week with uh, uh, a lot of uh, trials, no doubt, a lot of pain, especially because on Sunday we lost our D. Leroy. Uh, Leroy Modrell passed away Sunday morning at 6 a.m., and he'll be greatly missed. Um, but we know that he believed in the hope of resurrection. We trust that we will see him again. Our loved uh, Leroy is waiting for the Lord to call him. And... Uh, there's information about the funeral service this coming Tuesday. Uh, I believe it's at 11 a.m. at uh, the Thomason uh, funeral services here down the street. Um, so uh, if you need more information, you can go to our, uh, our web page. You can go to our Facebook page and also look into the e-news where we provided information about that. Uh, then the plan is to have him buried that afternoon in Pflugerville around 3 o'clock. If you want more information, more specific information, you can look into that. So um, even though our hearts are grieving, we can be thankful that we have hope. And I pray that that hope will carry us through. I want to wish you a happy Sabbath and welcome you, those who are watching online and those who are here present uh, worshiping the Lord. Um, now it's our turn to open up with prayer. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Glad you are here, both online and in person. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for bringing us here safely. Please be with us, not able to make it. Thank you so much for our family and friends. Please be with us today and bring us honor to you. In your precious name, amen.
invite our deaconesses, our elders, and also our deacon that is getting ordained today. Uh, please, Derek, come forward, Javier, uh, everyone that is going to be ordained uh, today, please come forth. Um, and I would also like to invite um, the, uh, the elders that are present in our church. It seems like I don't have sound, right? Uh, can I have sound on my mic? Is it? Yeah, this is better. Much better. Thank you. Um, so please come forward. Please come gather in the middle. Uh, we're going to try to find enough space up here while we keep the... Uh, oh, there you go. No wonder. It was on me. My bad. It was around my belly button. That doesn't help, right? Um, so I'm going to invite the elders that are present here. The scriptures talk about this moment of, of ordination. Uh, how is that Jesus dedicated his disciples into, into service? I love what Ellen White writes in the book, Desire of Ages, regarding this precious moment when Jesus dedicated the lives of his followers, his disciples. How is that he empowered them and he entrusted them with a mission. Ellen White writes in the Desire of Ages, page 296, when Jesus had ended his instruction to the disciples, he gathered the little band close about him and kneeling in the midst of them and laying his hands upon their heads, he offered a prayer dedicating them to his sacred work. Thus the Lord's disciples were ordained to the gospel ministry. I love how she describes this scene as a very simple scene. The Lord praying, putting his hands upon those who had an awesome mission to accomplish, doing something special for them. You know, we believe that as a church, we represent our Lord on earth. Everywhere we go, we show people who God is. And we are also God's instruments. We also believe in the priesthood of all believers. That means that all of us, you, me, people that have been uh, officially appointed, are called to serve the Lord. But at the same time, as we call people from darkness to God's wonderful marvel of light, we are also invited to dedicate our lives specially for him. And that's exactly what, what these individuals are doing. They're accepting a greater responsibility. That is a privilege because at the end of the day, we are serving our wonderful God. I am really thankful for your willingness to serve. And I pray that God will enable you. You know, it's not about us. It's about Him. It's not about our abilities, our intelligence, or our wisdom. But it's about our willingness to be used. So right now, I would like to I invite you to kneel down and to gather um, as close as we can, just at our arm's length if possible. And, uh, and dedicate our lives to the Lord. So I'm going to ask the elders and th that are present just to reach out and put your hand on, on the, each other's shoulder. If you can, can we do that? Can we just, um, uh, Bill, could you help us on this end? I think we have more people on this side for you to bless. So let's pray and asking the Lord to bless this new people and enable them for service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for each individual that is here. At this point, Father, we ask for a special blessing upon Vilma, upon Javier, upon Brandy, and Lisa, and Lulu, 
and Christy and Derek. We thank you, Lord, because you are faithful. Because you have called them with a special purpose. Because you're giving them a chance to serve you in a more humble manner. Be with each one of them, Lord, as they struggle, but at the same time as they give their best to bring glory and honor to your name. Just as Jesus ordained his disciples for ministry, we want to ordain this precious individuals, elders, deacons, deaconesses, to send them out to be lights wherever they go. May the gospel reach our city, San Marcos, our state, our country, and get to the ends of the earth. May we become your instruments. Thank you, Father, for this calling. And thank you for your spirit that will enable us to finish the work. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So, in this simple way, you are sent to serve here in our church, but also in our community and wherever you go. God bless you. Testing. All right. Um, I'm doing the chilling story today. I'm not just standing up here with a backpack for laughs, but um, I recently had the chance to uh, do a backpacking trip um, a couple weeks ago with our former pastor, Chad. Some of you guys probably remember him. And uh, it's something I've been doing each year around my birthday um, for the last six, seven years, and it's been a big blessing. And um, the last couple times I've come back, God has uh, given me a, a spiritual lesson about the backpacking trip, so I wanted to share that with you guys today. Um, if you could, there's a couple pictures I want to show you. Is that going to happen or not?
Kenny shot is not there. Um, <laughs> all right, so I'll try to recreate this. Can you, Christy, can you send that picture to her while I'm talking or no? It's not, it's not happening. Okay. <laughs> um, the last picture showed Art, the guy with the big backpack sitting on a rock, uh, not able to get up. And it showed Joe wrapping a bandage around his knee. Um, six miles um, from our exit point, from the car, Joe stopped walking and says, I can't walk anymore, my knee is gone. And we were on the side of a pretty steep uh, mountain and um, we were very concerned. Oh, there it comes. Um, Joe, Joe jumped into action. Um, God has given him a special gift of um, caring and um, especially for injuries, and he stood on the side of that pretty big drop-off and started wrapping Art's knee with a bandage he just, he just carries with him all the time. He pumped him full, full of Advil, um, and, uh, and, the, and he um, said, your pack is too heavy. So um, um, Joe unloaded all his water, his sleeping bag, his sleeping pad, basically took about 70% of his weight out of his pack and crammed it into his. And Joe said, I'm going to follow you down the mountain. And, and Art got up and he said, wow, feels a lot better with this pack so light. It doesn't even feel like there's anything on my back. And uh, took a step. He said, that's not too bad. And uh, said, L I'll, let's try it. And so he started going. And um, it, each step, it seemed to get better. In about 20 minutes, the ibuprofen kicked in and got better. And uh, Joe was able, I mean, yeah, Joe walked right behind Art, and they made it down the mountain. Myself, being the slow one, was kind of in the back, and Art says, I can't stop. If I stop, uh, it'll lock up again. So they just kept going the whole way, and so I didn't, we actually, they beat us back. Chad and I stayed kind of at the slower pace. But um, I want to read you a couple Bible verses. Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Um, here's another one. Turn your burdens over to the Lord, and he will take care of you. About a week after we got back, um, Art sent out a text to us. Man, this is going to be hard for me to read. I'll try it. All right. He said, um, hey, guys, I was thinking about the wonderful experience I had last weekend. It was amazing. I loved the scenery and company. Then he said, more importantly, there was someone who got down, bandaged my knee, gave me medicine, carried the weight, and followed me all the way down even lifting my pack when I had to stoop low. He also kept my mind off my knee, conversing with me to the end. <coughs> this is taking a lot longer than I thought. Joe, you reflected Jesus to me. You tended to my wounds, you relieved my pain, you carried my burdens, and you walked and talked with me to the end. So my message to young people is there's a way you can help your friends. Sometimes they have burdens that you can help them with. You can love on them. You can hug them. You can talk to them about their problems. And in this way, you represent Christ. And to everyone else, remember that Christ is always there. When you feel overwhelmed, he will carry your burdens. He will help you down from those mountains. Thank you. Derek helped me out this morning with my special music. Um, my song is one that I think is familiar. It's It Is Well With My Soul. Um, Horatio, you've probably heard the story um, 
lost his son and his business in the Chicago fires, and then later lost his daughters um, as they were moving back or traveling to Europe. And despite all that loss, he still managed to say, it is well with my soul. And I know all of us have lost something or or have been in those um, desperate moments, but just don't forget that God is with us, just like um, Art felt his friend was not, or he was not alone on that walk. We are not alone in this life. trial should
Is it, there you go, there you go. We're good, we're good. Thank you. As, as I was saying, today is Dolores Kinsey birthday, so let's, we're going to do two things, okay? One, can we sing happy birthday here? Uh, it, she's watching us online. She's going to be able to see us or hear us singing happy birthday. Two, I would like to invite you right after service. As you know, she lives in the neighborhood right across the street. So why don't we do like a drive-by happy birthday party and we honk as we drive in front of her house? I'm sure the neighbors will love it. So why don't we sing to Dolores first um, and... Uh, and then we're going to organize ourselves to go after service and drive by and honk as loud as we can. But let's sing happy birthday to her. Is that okay? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dolores. Happy birthday to you. Dolores, we love you, and we'll see you soon. Uh, this, um, this Sabbath, I would like to focus on a, um, on a few passages of the scriptures that at this moment, especially for the time we live in, may be a little bit conflicting as we deal with the scriptures and the teachings in the time of the end. I pray that we'll be able to, to make sense of some of the things that we have assumed for years. And I pray that this message will start some conversations. It's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of information. You know, I, I received a meme as a joke from a friend. Uh, he was quoting Ellen White's statement about how is that pastors should not preach long. Don't you say amen to that? So there's this meme, and this guy circled uh, that phrase, you know, pastors shouldn't preach long. What he didn't do is to block the next few lines. Because she says, for the first 60 minutes, pastors should take advantage of the fact that people are awake and ready. They should take advantage of the first 60 minutes and then the next 60 to bring the application. For Ellen White, a short sermon lasted two hours. So... I have 24 pictures to go through. Don't worry. Don't get scared. It's not going to be two hours. But I just want to highlight the fact that it is interesting how things, especially when it comes to time, becomes relative to some of us, huh? But maybe a long time for some, it's a short time for others. I'm going to invite you to go to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans 8. 28. I know you know this verse. Romans 8, 28. Paul is writing to the Romans. Paul is writing to a church that at the moment was being persecuted. A church that at the moment was being attacked. Christians were dying because of their faith. So Paul writes to the church in Rome. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And before we read a single word from the Bible, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes right there where you're at and ask the Lord to guide our thoughts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open our eyes. More than anything, Father, open our hearts to welcome words of encouragement, of hope. And Father, I beg you, to give us a better understanding of the scriptures as we read them. Please, Lord, hide me behind Jesus as I share the message that you have placed in my heart. Talk to us today, Father. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen. 
Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things for good. As you may know, this past week and a half, have been very difficult for my family. I've lost two family members because of coronavirus, because of COVID-19. My dear Aunt Lulu, who was my kindergarten teacher, who fell in love with my uncle as I was her student. And then a couple of days ago, I lost an uncle a retired pastor, a guy that had dedicated his life to serve the Lord. So, how come is that all things can work for good? What kind of explanation can we find to the awful things that come our way? How can we say that in the midst of pain? When we ask questions and we face doubts, how can a senseless death work for good? There are different elements that we should consider. But when we read some texts like this one in Romans, we cannot help but wonder and ask, Lord, are you paying attention? Are you there? Did you forget about me? Am I missing something here? Or is it possible that the scripture doesn't mean what I think it meant for me? I have to say that we live in a society that is becoming more and more self-centered. Have you noticed? We live in a society that uh, is all about our individual perception our individual convictions. We even talk about our individual freedoms. There's nothing new. If you look into sociology, you're going to find that there's different individuals that have uh, uh, lived through time, generations. You know, we talk about the baby boomers. We talk about the people that grew up in the 60s and the 70s. During that time, there was a huge focus on self people that wanted to become better themselves, who transformed their houses and, and even their houses and even their bodies, uh, people that, that decided to move away from the protests and activism and focus more on themselves. They wanted to have fun, to be fulfilled, to enjoy life. Some sociologists call boomers the me generation. And it's interesting that when, when the me generation became Adventist, uh, we baptized them, them with their egocentrism. <laughs> we sing the beautiful praise chorus, it's all about you, Jesus. But in the meantime, we are in church as long as I like the service as long as I like the building, as long as I like the people that are worshiping there, as long as I like the music, and as long as I like the length of time of the service. At some point in this generation, we change the take up your cross and follow me for come to Jesus and he will make your life better. Then we have the Xers, my generation, Generation X. People that grew up with a, with, a, with a key hanging from our necks, right? Because we would get home, and mom and dad were working, so there was nobody there. Uh, the TV was our nanny. 
We had the freedom to do what we needed to do. And that's because we consider ourselves as Xers the center of the universe. <laughs> but then we get to criticize the next generation, huh? The millennials. We criticize the millennials. Uh, these are the children of the Gen Xers. The Gen Xers are the children of the baby boomers. Have you seen Gen Xer parents? That's the perfect definition of helicopter parents. They want to make sure the kid, their kids have all that they didn't get to have. There is a uh, constant search for giving attention to our children. And millennials are accustomed to that. And because of that, they have grown with a strong sense of self-esteem. But it's also <laughs> a little dangerous because it's verging on narcissism, some would say. There's a strong sense of entitlement. You see, our children have always gotten what they wanted, and they don't take criticism very well. In other words, we live in a society that for generations has been centered on ourselves. You may be thinking, where are you going with this, Pastor? Well, think about it, how it affects our perception of God. Do you need a friend? God is there. Are you looking for direction in life? God has a plan. You want a more fulfilling marriage? God has the answers. It's interesting that some uh, uh, sociologists have also talked about the fact that at church we have more consumers than givers. Now, this is a very dangerous perspective. Because whenever we read the scriptures, we tend to think that it has to apply to me. And, and please, don't run into conclusions. I'm going to explain myself. It's a tricky misunderstanding. Because when we read the scriptures, we ask, what is in it for me? When we think about church and religion, we, we ask, what is in it for me? I mean, after all, I'm the center. Now, what makes this misunderstanding so tricky is that it's built upon two very positive beliefs. One is the belief that we have as Adventists, as Christians, that the Bible applies to me, right? Do you think that's true? Yes, it is. The Bible must apply to me. We believe that the Bible applies to us at every age. We believe that the scriptures have an effect that are relevant for us today. The second thing is that we believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was trustworthy then, so he must be trustworthy now. But we struggle with the fact that sometimes God is unpredictable. Still, we believe that his compassions never fail. So we affirm both of these statements. One, the Bible applies to us as Christians, as Adventists. Two, God doesn't change. He's not capricious. The huge problem whenever we apply these foundational ideas is that we tweak them through the lens of me. So these two principles are true. The problem is that sometimes we forget about how the scriptures were given. Think about it a little bit. When God gave his children the scriptures, they would be read in public they would be read. God's message was read to the congregation. People would hear it. In the Old Testament, the prophets would send a message to God's people and they would preach in the city for more than one individual to hear. So there was the concept of us as God's people. That is key. That is very important. Whenever you read the Gospels, you're going to find 
that the gospel writers wrote the story of Jesus for people in general to hear the story. For parents to tell the story to their children. You see, God gave it to be written and then to be communicated verbally to a group of people. If you read the letters that Paul wrote, letters that would be read in public at church, and that was a blessing. But with that, as time passed, we wanted to share the scriptures with more people, didn't we? And that's a great thing. We have the Protestant Reformation. And Bibles went from being chained in the pulpit to, to being printed. Gutenberg was able to produce Bibles so people would have Bibles at home, so people would be able to read the scriptures on their own. And that's why we have a Bible, right? We own a Bible. The challenge here is that the communal process, the process where the scriptures were supposed to be read and presented to the public, all of a sudden became something that was just for one at home. You know what challenge comes from that? The challenge that, that, that presents as, as, as us trying to apply to our time stuff that has a specific context in the past. Does that make sense to you? And we apply it according to our culture. Let me just give you a little brief example. Uh, we read about the, the parable of the prodigal son, right? So the, what is the thing that gets the, the, your attention in the parable of the prodigal son? The prodigal son takes his inheritance while dad was still alive, and he goes and he, what does he do with it? He spends it all. And that is the part that we emphasize. The son spent it all. He wasted it because of our eyes in the Western society on this side of the world. We dislike that. For us, resources are, are limited. But then, we, if you go to another side of the, of, of the world, you're going to see that people with different set of eyes will... Read the parable and find things that you never thought of. I was reading through some statistics about how is the different cultures interpreted the parable of the prodigal son in a different way. You know, there's, there's cultures, especially in the East, that when they read the parable, what really strikes them hard is the part of the famine. The part of the famine. Now, we don't care about the part of the famine simply because we don't know what a famine is. Right? We're not familiar to that concept. We tend to interpret what we read according to our eyes. Other cultures don't even see the part when the sun wasted all the resources, but they focus on the famine. Why? Because the parable, after all, is about a son that was lost. And what matters is that the father was willing to receive him, that the father had a solution, not only because he made mistakes, but also because he was in pain, because he was suffering. So you see, if you have attended Bible studies, whenever you get to an interesting verse, the first thing that we ask is, what does this verse mean to me? Right? Right? What does this verse mean to me? The challenge with that is that we've gotten to a point that sometimes we think that because we have a Bible, we own the Word of God. I do have the Word of God. So it's all about me. And sadly, many of us interpret the Scriptures wrong. Because we think that I'm at the center. We believe that the Bible endorses the preoccupation with ourselves. We're going to read a couple of Bible verses that are the center of our message in a couple of minutes. 
but I wanted to lay, lay this, this foundation so we will understand the actual challenge that we have. Whenever we go to a Bible study, we, we ask, so what does it mean to you? For those who attend our Wednesday Bible study, we are going over the words of Jesus, right? We're going over the statements with the letters in red. And every Wednesday, we are covering those and, and talking about what it means to me. But I think we're asking the wrong question. I think we should ask, how does this apply to me? Because after all, the Bible means what it means. God had an intention. So it's not so much how I want to interpret it. It's about what God said. We all have a, a special Bible verse, right? Our favorite Bible verse. And think about it. Why is it your favorite Bible verse? Why? Because it means something special to me. Our preoccupation with me also leads us to confuse the application with meaning. We forget again that technically the verse means what it means. And because of that, sometimes we, we think that I am the center. I am important. So God's plan must be centered around me. Because of that, we can be unrealistic on our expectations about God. Because when things don't happen the way we expected, we start questioning if the scriptures are true. Whenever things don't develop the way we expect it, because that's how we interpret it, we start doubting God and questioning his promises. You see, whenever we center the scriptures on us, it is so easy to miss the mark. David said in Psalm 37, 25, I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. And if you have never been in that situation, it's okay. But what about those who don't have anything to eat for tomorrow? Is it that they, they're not loved by God? Is it that God forgot about them? So at some point, some people think, if this verse is not true for me, then it cannot be true at all. So right now, I would like to focus on two Bible verses. First, Jeremiah 29, 11. And the second one, the verse we read at the beginning, Romans 8, verse uh, 28. But the first one, have you heard it? Have you shared it before? Jeremiah 29, 11. Are you familiar with it? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I believe we see that Bible verse a lot when graduation comes. Right? Maybe you buy this little, little picture with the verse in it and you give it to your son, to your friend who's graduating. It's a popular theme verse for students. But we often miss the content of the passage. Whenever God said this, his people were at the brink of disaster. God was speaking to people, to Judeans that were facing exile. It is clear when we read the immediate context. Jeremiah 29, 10 says, This is what the Lord say. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So in other words, this is not a Bible verse written for children that are graduating from high school or from college. 
This is a Bible verse that was given to God's people when they were being warned about the fact that the Babylonians would come, the Assyrians would come, and they would take them captive. And that they would spend 70 years there, two full generations in captivity. The plans that God is talking about here in Jeremiah 29, 11 are the good promise that after 70 years, God's people would return home. Verse 14 of Jeremiah 29 say, I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. It is clear that this verse was crafted for ancient Israel and not for my kid that is graduating. You see? We often take a Bible verse and think this is about me, and we miss the context. And when the plans for our kids don't come according to what we thought, we blame God. So how come? But you said that everything was going to be good, that you wanted to prosper us. Do you hear this gospel of riches that evangelical church, churches are preaching a lot all around the world? God wants you to be rich. So when that doesn't happen, who's at fault? God. Because he promised that I would prosper, right? Jeremiah 29, 11 says so. I have it on a sticker. Because we have made it about ourselves. We hijack this promise. And that's a a clear symptom of our tendency to take the Bible out of context. We may try to reason it and say, well, you know, as God cared and loved for people back then, he will also take care of me now. Hmm. Okay. The problem is that we think that it applies to us individually. We think that the promise is given to me specifically. And that may not be the case because the universe doesn't have me as a center. At that moment, the Babylonians were knocking at their door. Death and slavery. If they would survive the best case scenario, they would be slaves to the Assyrians. You know what's interesting? In the context, you'll see that whenever Prophet Jeremiah shared the news, he was questioned and he was mocked because only a hundred years before, God had delivered his people from the Assyrians. So even for their time, they thought, well, God did it yesterday, so I'm sure that he'll deliver us again a hundred years later. So God sent Jeremiah to set the nation straight. And let him know, brothers, sisters, there will be no miraculous deliverance this time. You, you will go into captivity. But even so, I still have plans for you, says the Lord. Even though you're going to go through some tough times, as a nation, I still have plans for you. That was Jeremiah's message. But we misread this verse in three ways. One, as we said, we tend to ignore the context. You know, King Zedekiah? King Zedekiah would have his children murder in front of him, and his eyes would be plucked out of his face so that the last thing he would see was his children being killed. We're prone to ignore passages that we consider irrelevant for us. You see, we love to read the book of Acts, right? Because it talks about the early church. But then we, when we go to the book of Judges, we go like, well, you know what, that's not really relevant for me today. 
what God was telling his people is that I will prosper you, but you're going to go into captivity for 70 years. In the context we read in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4 to 7, the God would bless their captors. The God would bless their enemies so he could bless them also. That he would not spare them from exile. That he would prosper them in spite of their condition of exile. And certainly many individuals languished without prospering, without the prospect of a bright future. They were going to suffer and suffer a lot. You know, the promise may not apply to me, but that doesn't mean that the promise doesn't apply to us. You see the difference? The promise may not apply to me individually, but the promise applies to God's people for sure. So we ignore the context. Also, we turn the we into me. God gave this message for his people. So we would have hope. That even we, as a church, as his followers, even though as we may suffer, God will still fulfill his promises. You know what? The third thing we do wrong is that we microwave the verse. I mean, we're talking about captivity for 70 years. We read the stories in the Bible, and we think, oh, you know, we went from one verse to the other, and the problem was solved. Oh, good. It's going to be a breeze. This challenge, this, this, this problem that I have, this defeat, this setback, it's just going to be for a few days. Maybe a couple of weeks. How about 70 years? God said, you guys are going to go through a lot of hardships. So I suggest that even though Israel was in the condition of exile, was what God is saying is that he would still prosper them by prospering those who would enslave them. And someday he would deliver them from exile. It would happen in the future. But until then, Israel could cling to the promise that God was still working for their deliverance. You see what we studied a couple of weeks ago? As we are underground like the miners in the story, remember? We must look at the scriptures and realize that there's a God that is active, getting things ready for us. That even though we may not see it, He is there. I think this verse applies to us as a church because after all, as Adventists, as Christians, as Christ followers, we're living in a state of exile, don't we? Peter refers to us as foreigners and exiles. We have been scattered among the nations, but our citizenship is still in heaven. We must remember that God is committed to grow his people. We are part of his church. We may not be the focus of every single thing, but we are part of his church. Knowing that God is working, his purposes for his church should bring hope. Second verse, Romans 8. There's a very interesting one. A challenging verse. Romans 8, 28. You see, it's another package, passage that we usually misread because of our assumption that us means me. And we know 
that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What happens when we read this verse and we find that there's problems and death and illness? I think, first of all, we misunderstand what all things mean. Because all things doesn't mean that all things are good, huh? Clearly, this is not what the passage means. If you read a little after Romans 8, 35, you'll read that Paul describes that we may go through hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. That's all things. So Paul is saying, God is with his people. God fulfills his promises to his people, but his people will go through all that. Still, he says, nothing can separate us from his love. Romans 8.28 is asserting that all things, good things, bad things, senseless things, the actions of good and bad people, good governments, bad empires, all are tools in the hands of an active, caring God who is faithful to bring about his purposes. This message was given to a church that was also being persecuted, killed, because they decided to be faithful to Jesus. It never meant that everything that happens to us is a good thing. If we say that, then we have to answer the question, then why is it bad things happen? You know, I often hear everything that happens is the will of God. And I respond, yes, in a way, but how about you? Are you doing God's will? I think it's a gross misreading of Scripture to use this verse to try to turn a bad thing into a good thing. Often we cite Job, right? The book of Job. And we like to look at and read the end of the book when Job gets new children. At the beginning of the book, his children are taken. And then God gives them children. I don't think it would make us even if God would took away my son and my daughters and then lay, later give me three new ones, Right? I would never ever want to quote Romans 8.28 to a grieving parent or a grieving wife. The point of this verse is not to say, hang in there, God is going to make, make it up for you. That is not it. The second mistake is, again, we think that this verse is for me. And we forget that God is preparing his people. And he's telling us all that even though we suffer and we struggle, he will work things for our good. That there are many things that we may not be able to understand. That there are many questions that have no answer at this point. But the Lord, who is faithful, will take care of each one of us. When we realize that each passage of the scripture is not about me, then we gradually are able to see that the subject matter of the Bible, what the Bible is about, is God's redeeming work through Christ. That God is beyond the sadness, the loss, the pain that this world brings to us. That God is with his people for the long run. That God 
is there when we suffer. No doubt. That, but that beyond our current circumstances, God has a plan. And his plan is that his church, his followers, will be able to enjoy eternity with him in heaven. That is the goal, you see. It's not just this time in life. He promises that we will face struggles, death, illness, loss. And as painful as it is, nothing will separate us from his love. I'd like to finish with a couple of quotes from Ellen White, the Review and Herald page. I'm sorry, Review and Herald of February 27 of 1894. It says, The Lord designs that his people shall be happy. And he opens before us one source of consolation after another, that we may be filled with joy and peace in the midst of our present experience. We are not to wait until we shall get into heaven for brightness and comfort and joy. We are to have him right here in this life. We miss very much because we don't grasp the blessings that may be ours in our afflictions. All of our sufferings and sorrows, all our temptations and trials, all our sadness and griefs, all our persecutions and privations, all, in short, all things work together for our good. All experiences and circumstances are God's workmen, whereby good is brought to us. Let us look at the light behind the cloud. Are we facing an awful pandemic? Yes, we are. Are we limited and life has changed? Yes, it has. Are we mourning the loss of people we love? Yes, we are. But let's remember that there's light behind the cloud. God never promised that he would spare us from pain, death, and sorrow. But he promised that he would be with his church, with us, every step of the way. So in order to understand God's promise in the scriptures, please, stop asking what it means to you. Stop asking what it means to me. The Bible means what it means. Instead, ask yourself, how does it apply to me? This specific situation, how does it apply to me? Also, remember that it's important to understand what the passage meant for them at the time, those who heard it first. And third, let's try, interpret, let's try to interpret biblical passages, not just as selfish individuals, but let's try to interpret passages of the promise of God as a church, what it means to us collectively. The youth instructor, January 23 of 1902. Ellen White wrote, Our happiness comes not from what is around us, but from what is within us. Not from what we have, but from what we are. As God's people, we have this everlasting beautiful word. A word that tells us from the beginning to the end that there is the main character, God, that would do anything possible to solve the problem of sin. Yes, generations would suffer. Many years would pass. But his word is true. And he will deliver his people when it's time. Brothers, sisters, 
let's recognize that it's not just about me. As a church, let's trust that we have a Lord that is faithful and that will fulfill each and every promise for his church just as he has done in the past. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we finish our service, we recognize that many times our eyes are blind. Many times, Father, we capriciously interpret the scriptures trying to tweak things so it'll say what I need. Help us, Lord, to open our eyes and realize that, that what you send us, what you gave us, means what it means, not to us in particular, but it applies to us in one way or, one way or another. Help us, Father, to have a hope and in the, in, in the assurance that even though we may not see the fulfilling of some of those promises, at the end, we will meet you and we will be proven that your faith, that your faithfulness, that, that your power is true and that even though sometimes we feel that we're walking alone, you are always by our side. Father, at this point, please give us hope and give us assurance. And give us wisdom as we read the scriptures. Help us, Father, to see your story, to welcome your love, and to be faithful to the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we leave, I want to remind you that uh, if